Uh, I'm Dr. Beverly Law. I'm an emeritus professor of global change biology and terrestrial system sciences at Oregon State University. I've spent several decades studying the impacts of climate and disturbance on forests. So I'm going to talk about the role of forests in the global carbon budget and how important it is to mitigate and adapt to climate change and forests' role in that. So first of all, uh, the amount of carbon that's in, in, in land plants and in the soil is close to that that's in the atmosphere. And that forests take up almost 30% of the carbon emissions from all sources annually. So that's really important too. We need to reduce emissions now substantially. And we need to find ways to be able to do that that are quick and cost effective. Um, now, I took data from the Harris paper and plotted their um, reasons for carbon loss from forests. So it's not emissions, but it's the carbon loss from forests. So um, that is, uh, so harvest obviously dominates it. And it was eight times, it was kind of surprising to see this, but eight times that of natural processes in the lower 48. And then we did a study that showed that uh, the carbon dioxide, the amount of carbon that's been removed from forests, cumulative amount for the past 115 years, has, um, has emitted about 65%, and then the remainder again is split between land use, I mean, uh, landfills and uh, wood products. A lot of people think it's they're storing it in wood products for a long time. I didn't think I would talk about that. I would divert too much attention from that. But the main point is land use dominates impacts on forest carbon. And it has the largest uncertainty. So it has often been put forward that there are technological solutions for addressing climate change. And those uh, solutions include uh, doing things differently in forests and harvesting them earlier and so forth. Um, but those kinds of actions really take um, they could be a lot more costly and they take more time to implement. Some are not ready for prime time and some have some unintended consequences, such as bioenergy burning for um, causing emissions to the atmosphere and then causing air pollution. So, um, and this is an image from my own research site. Um, about a month ago, the fire came through there. And we've been madly trying to re-instrument the site. The site has been running for, it's automated and has been running for 20 years. Um, this is the image of what it looks like from the ground level right by the tower. But I also have an image of, of it when um, from the top of the tower where you see it's a mix of verity fire. There, there are different areas that burned more worse than others. And so that's the way you really want it to happen because they can fill in quite well naturally. So how do we increase forest carbon when wildfires are increasing? Well, a lot of people think that that's really important, but we've got to give context to that. Again, land use and harvest in particular are the major sources of carbon to the atmosphere. And when it comes to wildfire, it's not quite as bad as everybody thinks. It has gotten worse in recent years, but it was, we had some real extreme events recently too. So uh, what's happened in the areas like the Western US is the urban areas have been impacted by fires. These are small communities that are near forests or just they're in uh, open areas where the grassy areas. Um, and so we have to think about how you might prioritize where you do, where you take action and how you go about it. So first we have to acknowledge that reducing fuels does not change wildfire trends. And targeting fuels reduction to increase adapt adaptation by some ecosystems, such as those that are in fire prone areas where fire has a rapid return interval, that might make sense. Um, but we also need to protect the communities. And that means things like uh, building defensible, defensible space around, around each house, making sure that current homes and new ones are hardened to wildfire and resistant to fires, things like that. So it takes re, um, incentivizing and planning communities in a way that they will be able to resist wildfires. 
And then to identify areas that might be resilient to fire, we look at where are they vulnerable in the future under future climate conditions, and that's done with model simulations. And um, what we were looking for here was, in addition to that, what forests are still likely to take up a lot of carbon in the future and have low vulnerability or moderate vulnerability to disturbances. And that turned out that it also was of great benefit to biodiversity. Those areas were of great benefit to biodiversity. To identify forests that are likely to be resilient to climate change, we run a land system model with future climate or climate projections uh, with different climate models and different CO2 scenarios, carbon dioxide scenarios. And then we run that forward and it also has a fire model in it. So if climate conditions are such where uh, it's drier and it's hotter and windier, those areas might be more likely to burn. And so it identifies those areas and it determines what the carbon um, uptake would be by the year 2050. It's when we ran this one to and another one is to 2100. This study went to 2100, that's right. And then we took an overlay of the current um, species richness as well as threatened endangered species where they're located. And then we ran in, uh, a model that we have that is being inserted in land model that, that determines um, how th that species of plants and trees, animals, birds, how they're going to redistribute with climate change. And then we look at that combination. Where are these areas where you have a win-win situation for both biodiversity and forest carbon potential under future climate conditions? So land use strategies to mitigate climate change include preserving existing forest lands and um, adding to those lands areas that were naturally forest before but are no longer forest or have uh, been degraded for one reason or another. So that's called re reforestation or restoration. And then we need to allow forests to fulfill their critical role in the carbon cycle and in biodiversity. So if we were to state the case um, for expanding forest preservation and conservation, the first point is that land use is the largest contributor to forest loss. That's where we need to put our efforts. And then expanding preserves is important, as well as building connectivity for migration and then conservation. All three of those will help build resilience to future disturbances. And then we have the next two to three decades to take action. And so the low hanging fruit is to do these natural climate solutions or implement those nice natural climate solutions because they are ready to go now. They have been doing a lot, a lot of work and taking carbon on the, out of the atmosphere in the past, and they can do so even more so in the future.